So I'd like to talk a little bit about the BIM sex role inventory. This is an important psychological test uh, created in the early 1970s. The best thing to do probably is to go ahead and take the test first before you actually uh, watch the rest of this video. Uh, I've got a couple of different options for you. Uh, one is the BIM sex role inventory online that is located uh, at that address that you see in front of you. So if you pause the video right here and uh, type that in, uh, you can do some of the questions on the test, read the directions, and uh, go through and, and, and put in your answers. And it'll spit out a score like the one that you see there at the bottom of the screen. Make sure that you write down what those scores are pretty exactly. So you want to write down the score for the masculine, uh, the score for the feminine, and uh, your score for androgynous or neutral. There's a second test uh, version that I actually like a little bit better. Uh, so if you go to this address here, uh, sidetoolkit.gla.ac.uk, uh, it will send you through a, a different kind of way to go through the test. It's the same exact test, uh, but it's uh, just scores it a little bit differently, uh, and I think it gives you a, a bit of a clearer score actually than the other one. Uh, but either one that you take uh, is perfectly fine. Uh, it should give you kind of the same uh, answer, the, the same sort of experience in general, but make sure you're also writing down the scores on this one. So if you want to go ahead and take that test first, please pause the video here and take that. I'll be waiting right here for you. Okay, so the test, the, the BIM sex role inventory, uh, was created by Stanford psychology professor Sandra BIM. Uh, she is uh, no longer with us, uh, but her legacy lives on in a lot of different ways, and her legacy is actually quite important. This test uh, is, has both historical and theoretical significance uh, to what we do in gender studies, and I'll explain why as, as we go along. Uh, so uh, I think the best way to explain exactly what the significance is, is to think about the advance that the BSRI represents to what was going on before. So before, you had psychological tests that treated masculinity and femininity, males and females, as conceptually distinct categories uh, so that a person would basically rest either in very masculine terms or in very feminine terms. And it was conceptualized kind of as a continuum, right? You'd have items on tests that would uh, work in ways that are uh, sort of get you to choose one track or another. Either you choose to be uh, very masculine or you choose to be very feminine in, in the way that, that you're answering. So BIM tries to take that conceptual model of masculinity and femininity being very conceptually distinct and within an individual person being uh, you know, an either-or kind of, of uh, personality trait, she introduces the concept of androgynous. Now, sometimes people get this a bit confused. Uh, androgynous does not mean somewhere sort of in between masculinity and femininity, like as if you're trapped in some sort of limbo between those. Androgynous really is talking about being both masculine and feminine, so that you are able to use both sets of traits in flexible kinds of ways. So androgynous is really about gender flexibility, not about being kind of somewhere in between. So within any individual person for this category of androgynous, there are both masculine traits and feminine traits. So you're sort of pulling from both rather than being stuck on one track or another. So when you take the test, the BIM sexual inventory test, what you'll see is each person gets rated on both sets of traits. 
if you score high on the masculine traits and low on the feminine traits, you're considered masculine. If there's the reverse, if you have a low score on the masculine traits, or you know, what they consider a low score is not, it's not as if you're sort of taking a math test and you're doing it wrong if you get a low score. It just means that you score below the median on that particular set of traits. Uh, so you are you tend to use fewer masculine behaviors and masculine traits uh, in the way that, that you operate. So if you score low on the masculine and higher on the feminine, then the, uh, the test comes out as, as showing a more, much more feminine approach to sex roles. And then to get androgynous, you would score high on both masculine traits and feminine traits. So you're high on both of those. Uh, and this is a, an important consideration. This is really kind of the theoretical breakthrough of the BSRI uh, that showing that there, that an allegiance to both masculine traits and feminine traits in different situations is really uh, something that is positive and psychologically healthy. That's kind of what she's after. And it's really about this notion of context adaptability. So that if you were in a context where it's appropriate to use masculine traits, you can use those and feel comfortable using those. If you're in a context where using feminine traits is appropriate, you can use those feminine traits and you feel comfortable and it's not psychologically damaging to you. So exactly how does this test show this? Well, here's a, a table from the original article that talks about uh, the uh, femsex role inventory and its uh, validity and re reliability properties and, and what it's trying to show. So you can see here that there are 20 masculine items, 20 feminine items, and then 20 items that are just neutral. They're not the androgynous items necessarily, but they're just, they don't necessarily fit into either category. In some ways, they're sort of filler uh, to make sure that you're not sort of catching on to, to what's going on. These were developed by uh, having hundreds of Stanford undergraduates sort various adjectives into either masculine or feminine categories. So uh, when this was initially put together in the 1970s, right, these were the kind of gender roles uh, that, that were put together. Now you'll notice that each one of these uh, items has a number beside it. That's the number within the test. You add up the scores, one to seven, uh, for each of those particular items, and then that score gets uh, put on a, a scale for what the median is for all people who have, who have taken the test. So you end up with basically three scores. The really important scores for them are the masculine items and the feminine items, and you kind of ignore the neutral items. Uh, the masculine items score will tell you how much uh, you identify or use these sort of masculine traits or what are were thought at the time to be masculine traits. And the feminine items would be the feminine traits. So when you plot those scores, if you get averages or medians above, or a score above the median on both masculine and feminine, you would score as androgynous. If you got very low scores on both, so if you uh, didn't identify with masculine or feminine, uh, it would be given a, a score of what she called undifferentiated. So that's kind of exactly how the test works behind the scenes. So this test also helps us kind of distinguish as we think about the concepts of sex and gender, right? So remember we talked about sex being a biological trait, uh, things like brain composition, things like hormones, external genitalia, those kinds of things. Well, when you take this test, you can really see the difference in terms of gender. It's about how you 
act in the world. It's in some ways a psychological property, in other ways it's a very sociological kind of property. It's a way of using discourse, of clothing, of hairstyles, of uh, voice inflections, all those sorts of things. Uh, you can really start to see those kinds of differences in terms of, you know, if you're if you're talking about leadership, right, and uh, or talking about shyness, those have gendered valences. Those aren't biologically connected necessarily. Uh, you know, you could uh, have arguments about whether your genes, you know, may contribute to your shyness and those kinds of things. But in general, those kinds of things are not determined at birth. Those kind of happen over time and through psychological development, uh, social development, those kinds of things. It's also important to remember that BIM had a feminist activist agenda for the BSRI. She wanted to show that gender is changeable, that this notion of um, androgyny had conceptual validity to it, that it was an actual um, uh, phenomenon in the world that worked people psychologically and she showed that actually quite quite well through using this particular test but she also wanted to show that you know that stepping out of those restrictor excuse me restrictive gender roles is psychologically healthy so this notion of androgyny it wasn't trying to prove that there's some sort of like middle ground between uh, masculinity and femininity that people could inhabit and it would work fine it, it, remember Androgyny is about being able to use both when it's contextually appropriate. And so she was trying to show, and, and did quite well, that being able to use masculine traits when it's appropriate and when it's advantageous, and being able to use feminine traits when it's appropriate and advantageous uh, was a psychologically healthy kind of approach. Now, of course, there have been critiques of the test, and you can probably think of a few right off the bat from uh, having taken the test yourself. I mean, probably one of the ones that is the most uh, often heard is this notion that uh, the, the test is not temporally valid. In other words, it reflects old ways of thinking about gender, uh, such that you know, it, since it was created in the 1970s and things have changed so drastically since the 1970s that, you know, you can't really consider uh, that what they thought of gender back then is, is, is still what we think about gender today. Now, there's been some studies about this. Uh, some people have found uh, that that is actually true, that, that, that there is no uh, sort of still uh, validity and reliability to some of these concepts, some of the adjectives she uses uh, for the test items. Uh, but there are other studies that, that show that a lot of them actually are still uh, salient. So uh, you, you have to kind of use this with a certain amount of caution. Uh, another critique, of course, is that it's based on self-report. Uh, when you take a survey and sort of try to imagine yourself fitting into certain categories, if you take a test that you know is about sex roles, uh, that might influence how you answer those kinds of questions. You might answer those questions to, to try to you know, imagine yourself or to make yourself look as if you fit those, those gender terms. Uh, to, the, to what extent that is actually uh, you know, a valid critique of basically every survey is, is one thing to, to think through, but there are some concerns, of course, about you know some of these uh, concepts in the BIM sex role inventory are clearly socially more acceptable, you know, things that you might want to actually have said about you. Another critique is that it doesn't necessarily capture the full complexity of masculinity and femininity. Uh, these concepts of masculinity and femininity are complex and they have lots of psychological properties and social properties, developmental properties, biological properties uh, that you can't really capture in 60 items. I think using the BIM sex role inventory in addition to a number of other things can be uh, the, the most valid way to think about masculinity and, and femininity and not solely relying on that one particular test. As a kind of closing thought, though, I want to 
I want to suggest that despite the problems that the BSRI has, it remains a highly used and historically and theoretically important psychological test. It does have some problems. Uh, and again, I wouldn't use it as the only uh, kind of measure that you would use for, for gender roles. But if we, I think it's still valuable to use the test in classes like this to start thinking through what we mean by gender and, and how it works. Uh, to think about this concept of androgyny and to think about the ways in which adhering to certain gendered and uh, sex-based roles uh, might be problematic for individuals. Uh, all of those things, I think, have been spurred on uh, by the BSRI, and so it's uh, a very important test. So I hope you enjoyed taking the test, if you did take it. Uh, maybe you've learned a little bit about yourself in taking it. Uh, hopefully, at the very least, you've learned a little bit about the, the test itself by watching this video and uh, by thinking through some of the theoretical things that it does. Thanks for listening. See you soon. Thank you.